Here are 10 of the most common mistakes that cellists make. Hi, I'm Clay from the cello.online, and here's a list of some common things, some pitfalls that cellists fall into. And notice I didn't say beginners. Most of this list applies to everyone. Yes, I'm talking to you out there. Even some of the most advanced players can fall victim to some of these things here on the list. Number one is not listening to recordings. And yes, this definitely applies to everyone, beginner, advanced alike. I see it all the time where I'll ask a class, uh, I'll ask my students, did you go listen to the recordings? Did you look them up? Uh, did you try to find some performances of it? And the answer is inevitably no. You know, the recordings uh, give us the goal, okay? They give us the the end result that we are trying to achieve. And when we're students, this is so very important. It's not meant to copy, right? We're not, it's not, we're not trying to, you know, like we're taking down dictation and we're going to go play it exactly like that. Uh, one, one should hope, right? But we're just trying to get an idea, get the information of what it is that we're trying to achieve. I mean, this is like with any with anything else. We're setting goals, and what helps us set the goals? Knowing what the goal sounds like, knowing what the end result sounds like. It's so important, and it's so important that you go listen to multiple recordings, not just one. Now, this next one leads to several other things on the list, okay? Or it can help you avoid uh, a few other things here on the list. So if you get this one right, you'll get several other things right, and that is practice in front of a mirror, all right? or not practicing in front of a mirror. I can't tell you how often I recommend it to students and I say, did you practice in front of a mirror this week? And I get, no, all right. I, as a college student, as a cello major, I lived in front of the mirror, okay? And the number one here on the kind of side list here, the sub list here under mirror is left hand shape, right? I gotta be able to see my left hand shape correctly. If I crane over, if I'm playing something as simple as a scale, I got a crane way over. Look at my shoulder gets pulled all out of whack, right? Look at my shoulder. It's just, it's just wrecked now. Yeah, my posture is wrecked, everything. Or something like thumb position. You know, when you go watch those recordings, because you listen to me in step one, you're going to see all these gorgeous, beautiful left hands here in thumb position for all that stuff that, you know... that you're trying to learn, all right, in Haydn C major concerto. And to be able to interpret what you've seen, you need to look straight ahead like you did when you were watching the video. Even if you crane around and somehow you survive looking down like this or craning over like this, all right, you still can't see it from the same angle. Having the mirror there gives you that same perspective so that you can see, okay, if you also have a nice left hand shape up here in the upper positions. That is so important. And yeah, by the way, that's not for beginners, right? This is a very, very advanced thing. Something we really, really need the mirror for when we start playing up here really high and playing in thumb position. You also need the mirror for the right hand. I can't look over and actually see if my fingers, all right, looking at my digital mirror over there, the computer screen. If I have a mirror, I can see if my fingers are actually doing what they're supposed to while I'm moving the bow. I can't look over, <laughs> right, and see. I need to be able to look straight ahead. This is why the mirror is so important, okay? So that while I'm pulling the bow, You know, this is the one silver lining from the pandemic is always having that screen, always having that reflection in front so that as I was demonstrating stuff, I could see if I was really, really doing it correctly. I did love that part of the pandemic. I pretty much hated everything else, but I did love the fact that I always had the reflection in front of me. Um, now, still, we're still with the mirror. Bow straight. Am I keeping a consistent contact point? Now, by the way, it doesn't have to be a just a mirror on the wall, right? It can be an electronic device. It can be an iPad. It could be a Chromebook. It could be a phone. I actually have a video all about practicing with phones or practicing with a digital device here on the channel. And in some cases, the device might be advantageous over the mirror, which is flat on the wall. Because our cello is what? Or at an angle here, right? And then the mirror is flat. If you have, say, a Chromebook where you can like actually tilt the camera down and have it be at the same angle as the cello, 
that actually gives you an even more accurate view of whether or not your bow is straight. I love being able to look over there and know if my contact point is staying use this one it's such a great piece it's just such a wonderful piece okay or actually how about a little allegro passionato all right and i want to make sure i'm down here using the right contact point <laughs> Moving on. Elbow height. That was the other thing under mirror. <laughs> I just wanted to play for you guys. Um, elbow height. All right. Elbow height. All right. Again, I can't. <laughs> I can't crane around or look. I need to be able to look because look, I'm in my lessons. I'm looking at my teacher. They're showing me. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at it from this angle. This is the information that I have in my brain. So I need to be able to look straight ahead and see that similar information there in the mirror to know if I'm doing it correctly. All right. So actually the mirror, and I, so I put it here early in the list, all right, because it's such, uh, it has so many other things that it affects. Number three, finally getting to number three here, and that is, of course, cello in the correct position. And the there, of course, there's a lot of variations, a lot of variables here that go into, you know, causing the cello to be in the, the wrong position. But the number one that I see is too straight up and down. I see this so often, all right, where this thing is so straight up and down. I'm not sure why that is. I think it has to do with maybe it's a little more comfortable, all right, to reach this hand like this, maybe to the neck. I'm not sure, all right. Every once in a while I see it where it's a little too low, all right, cello getting down, resting on my belly. But most often it's this. Cello is up way too high. I think also, you know, this is kind of a Baroque style of playing. Maybe this is why in the Baroque era, um, you see pictures of people playing kind of like this. Uh, it brings the string very close to me, right? I'm not really having to extend very far, all right, to get to it. Um, and it makes this a little bit more, uh, you know, right angle, okay? Not some weird kind of hybrid twisted angle. So maybe that's it. I don't know. Maybe that's why we end up sitting back and straight Maybe there's just something natural to it. All right, but we're not going to be able to get all the different sounds, all the different colors. We're not going to be able to get all the power that we need out of the instrument. All right, if we end up in that habit, we got to get it at this correct angle, peg behind our neck. Number four, hand shape. Now I'm going to mention them together because I, I kind of already mentioned them both there under number two with the mirror. But maybe you're practicing with the mirror. You're getting that device out. You're looking and you're seeing these fingers rounded, you're seeing these fingers go down the bow correctly, all right, but behind these fingers is hiding this thumb, all right, and uh, behind these fingers is hiding this thumb, this other half of the hand back here, all right, maybe, maybe this step should be called thumb shape, not hand shape, all right, but it is the hand squeezing down accidentally, and sometimes we don't always catch that, all right, when we're just looking in, in the mirror. Yes, you got to look in the mirror, you got to play with this nice finger approach, finger shape, all that, elbow height, all right, but you also have to keep this hand open in the proper shape. Yes, thumb behind second finger. Nice round openness there. Okay, all right, same over here on the bow hold. Hands got to be open, not squeezed together. What I see so often is students squeezing down like this, all right, and this thumb is touching, all right, the side there, touching the palm because it's squeezing down, all right. You have to practice slowly. And you have to build up these muscles slowly, often with beginners. All right, I will do just one string at a time. And stay on one string. That really helps me focus on my hand shape and not squeeze. And you just gotta, you know, you gotta avoid this. All right, you gotta be really, really proactive and keep these fingers rounded. Same over here. All right, uh, there's lots of bow grip aids to help you keep this thumb rounded over here 
whoop, wrong angle. Speaking of angle. Okay, all right. Remember, we don't want this. All right. No foxes, we say to the little ones. Okay, got to keep this hand open, thumb rounded. Hand shape, hand shape, hand shape. Okay, here we go. Number five, bow hand wrist not bending. We're talking about this bend right here. Okay, as I'm coming into the frog or coming out to the tip, that it bends the opposite direction, right? As, as I'm using the whole bow, that this wrist is flexing. Okay, if this is not flexing and bending, well, this is not loosening up and I can't play fast. Okay, and also I can't keep the bow straight. Okay, parallel to the bridge, perpendicular to the string. If this wrist is constantly staying straight like this, and you can see how straight it is there, right? And this is when I get the. Okay. Oh, should I do it? Okay. All right. That's that's what I get when this wrist doesn't bend up because look, this bow starts to cut the string like this, right? You must learn to bend this. One little trick I use in the studio is just make a, a circle here with your thumb and index finger and actually touch the C string, right? With these two fingers touching the C string at the same time. It forces this bend right here, okay, in the wrist, okay? So you've got to be conscious of that. And this is where the mirror, back to step one, comes back into play, right? Is that if I'm forced, if I'm practicing there, look at the reflection, let's go back to the D string, and forcing this bow to stay straight, stay straight, stay straight, okay, all right, then I must bend. And when it stays straight, oh man, I immediately see that this bow is going crooked, right? I gotta bend it to keep it straight, okay? This is a biggie, not letting this thing bend so the bow can do what it needs to do. Number six, not focusing on tone nearly enough, all right? At the time of this recording, I just recorded another video, um, and I'll link it up here in the cards and in the description, you know, saw some very, very advanced players at a conference recently, okay, as in the last few days, where they're still getting coached uh, about just getting the bow into the string, okay? Very, very advanced players, and they played wonderfully. It was beautiful, all right? They did a fantastic job, but still need to get the bow into the string more. Still not thinking about tone on that next level, okay? And this is something that we're just continuously working on, right? We start, okay, in French folk song, right? Where we have... And right from the get-go, okay, in that piece, and even in the twinkles too, getting the arm weight into the string, all right, uh, so that I get the full sound of the instrument. I have to have that so when I get to something like, say, you know, the, the Beethoven minuet. I gotta get the bow into the string or else I end up with something like. something just really wispy that doesn't sound like a cello at all, right? I want I want all of the color, I want all of the emotion. All right. Every time I want to hear that full sound, full weight, okay? Even if it's soft, right? We're not talking about dynamics. We're not talking about the volume of the sound. We're talking about the quality of the sound. And a big pitfall, just saw some really advanced players do it, a big pitfall that a lot of students make is not focusing, to, is taking this for granted. Oh, my bow uh, is going across the string. It's making a good sound. I'm done. No, no, no. Not done. Not done. Number seven, not practicing with the metronome. This is so important. It just goes without saying. You have to have the metronome to keep yourself in check, to make sure you're meeting your goals. You know, as I tell students, it has little to do actually with your sense of rhythm. Even if your sense of rhythm is wonderful, even if you're the best musician in the world, 
because of our bowed string instruments, because of the need to practice the most efficient way. You know, when you're practicing things in this span of time over and over again, and you keep that consistent, your learning is so much more efficient, all right, because you're doing it the same way every time, and then your brain learns faster how to adapt, how to figure out what it is that it's doing, all that coordination piece, like when you're trying to learn to play something fast. And then as, you know, the younger you are, the, the less experienced you are with playing fast, moving the bow, controlling the bow, all that stuff, man, the metronome is just essential. And I get students all the time, well, I didn't practice with it. Oh, I didn't turn it on. They're free. You can get free apps, free websites where you can use them. Use the metronome. Number eight, playing pieces just beginning to end and not trying to break them down. This is a biggie and it just demolishes your progress. If you want to make progress, pick a specific section, practice it, make a goal. Don't just play beginning to end and go, well, that was good or that was bad. You got to do more than that. You got to say what it is you're trying to achieve in a specific spot and go for it. Okay. And you have to, you know, plan ahead and let that build up over time. Don't just sit down and play things beginning to end. Number nine, not changing your bow hair when it needs to be changed. It does wear out. It does get old and it does need changing. I have a video about that. I'll post it here. But just the short of it is that what happens is the bow hair smooths out. Then it no longer holds the rosin. Okay. And then it it doesn't make any sound or you just have to keep on rosining or it doesn't hold the rosin throughout a performance, right? It might hold it at the very beginning, just the stickiness of it, but the hair itself is made to hold the rosin in. So it lasts for the whole concert or whatever it is that you're playing. If you, or make it through a whole practice session. If the bow hair is not doing that, it needs to be changed. And number 10, last, but certainly not least, these are, as I said, these are stringed bowed instruments. I can't tell you how many times I've been in here and a student is not renting. Now, this is a different story if you're renting here, but you own your instrument and they've had it for three or four years. And I say, when's the last time you changed your strings? Never. Oi, that's bad. You know, I try to change mine at least once a year now when I was performing a lot more in bands and orchestras and different things. Uh, before I taught full time, I changed them every six months, right? When I was playing twice as much. So now I, I say... Regardless of how much you play, they've been sitting on the instrument, they've been sitting in the case, about once a year is a good rule of thumb. Maybe you could stretch that to 18 months or two years, but if you've had your strings for three or four years, they absolutely need to be changed. Now, these last couple that I mentioned might not be so black and white. It can kind of be hard to know if your strings really do need changing or if your bow hair really does need changing. If you're new to the cello, uh, if you haven't ever changed your bow hair or changed your strings, I have videos about each of those things. And if you want to know about changing your strings and when to, watch this video right here. And if you want to know all about bow hair, all right, and why it wears out and why you need to know, watch that video right here.